Uh, thanks very much everyone for, for coming out. Um, it's a weird experience sort of doing an inaugural. When I first sort of heard about um, doing it, I sort of had two thoughts. One was a bit of imposter syndrome. Like I didn't feel sort of deserving really or, or in a position to be able to give an inaugural lecture. Um, and the sort of second thing that sort of went uh, through my mind was I'm only part way done. Uh, I, I feel quite young to be given sort of an inaugural lecture. And I sort of thought to myself, well, I've got 25 years left of doing work. And that was sort of a depressing thought. It's like, oh my God, no, 25 years. But um, but it's it's really good to be able to to sort of be here. And, and part of what today is about is for me reflecting. Because if one of the things that actually doing an inaugural sort of makes you do is to reflect, uh, reflect on projects that I've been involved with, people that I've worked with, uh, and the many sort of sort of cherished experiences that have happened so far. And hopefully, I'll be able to give a little bit of an insight into those and some of the projects that, that I've, I've been involved with. Okay. So that's a little bit of the focus of, of what I'm going to be talking about. I'll do a little bit of a, an introduction. There's some mushy family stuff for a couple of slides, so bear with me through that. There's uh, the main sort of hub really is about rehabilitation uh, of people with convictions. Much of that is going to be about the work I've done on in interventions and intervention services. I'm going to talk a little bit about my work in prisons, particularly around prison climate, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is. And then the prevention of sexual abuse is some of the later work that I've been involved with. But actually, that's the theme really that sort of galvanizes sort of everything together, really, which is um, the prevention of sexual abuse. And then some sort of personal reflections. You know, you come to an end of an orgle, there's got to be some sort of philosophical musings. And so I'll do that as, as well at, at the end. So when you're sort of doing this, you sort of see others, you sort of try and get some inspiration. I think part of what that process is about is about thinking about actually where, you, where you've come from and, and where you're going um, as, as part of this process, you know, and for, for me as an individual, I think of myself as a, as a personal construct psychologist, a narrative psychologist. I'm interested in people's stories and where people come from and, and how people navigate different turning points in their lives. And so that got me thinking about where I where I came from. So this is uh, early Nick. This is from zero to 12 is where I grew up. I grew up in Intake, Doncaster. Um, Doncaster is a small sort of mining town and Intake is, how would you describe it, Mum? Pretty awful, really. <laughs> it's a it's a, a sort of council estate sort of area. We lived in the nice part, although you can't really tell it by what they've done to the brick wall there. Um, but what it did do was, we, we lived in Arco Road, which is actually quite funny because a lot of my family are from, um, oh look, Aaron, um, of, of, there's an Irish contingent uh, to it. And um, my grandma used to always say that we were related to, to Barry McGuigan. So I was sort of hoping that maybe tonight he'd have turned up and we could have had a, Beautiful reunion, but I'm pretty sure that everyone in Derry makes this claim that they're related to Barry McGuigan, this world famous boxer. But my early life was all about football. And actually, you can sort of see in the background of the field that I spent literally all of my time playing in that field. I'd get my dad's old trophies and we'd scribble out his name on them and stuff, and we'd put like thingy cup. And, and the other part is we live very close to Doncaster Royal Infirmary. And Doncaster Royal Infirmary is the big hospital in Doncaster. What was really cool about that was it was like an adventure playground for kids. You would just sort of go, well, you'd be chased by security guards and stuff like that. But it was fantastic for as, as young kids sort of in, in, the, in that area. So that was the, my sort of sort of early experiences. So my parents got divorced at, uh, when I was 12. I'm over it now, just about, you know. <laughs> I'm going to just like some moments here. I'm just joking. Uh, I got over it last year. Um, Football play continues to play a massive part of my life. This is me with my younger son. We were just uh, getting an award because he, I say we, I didn't do anything. I just coached, but they as a team got um, got an award for sort of coming second in, in, in the league. It's a cute picture, although his hair is a complete mess there, sunshine. And this, you can't really see this. This is my eldest son, but this, this, this made me laugh when I watched it simply because Dylan, he plays academy level football. If he, if he play, when he plays for us on a Sunday, he'll come off. He'll come off for five minutes at the most, but he's always like that, miserable. But I've done a little action shot to make up for it, Dylan, as, 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 as well. 
Um, and family is so very, very important to me. It's the crux of, of who I am. It's the sort of bedrock of who I am. It's the foundation. Everything I I, I am is 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 about my, my family, really. Uh, so I've got my stepdad there um, and, and my mum and our dog, Reggie. He's not really a dog. He's sort of a human strapped in, in fur. Um, and that's my dad and Karen, who aren't even here. He, he only rang me an hour and a bit ago. But anyway, so my dad's not here, unfortunately, but we can at least tell him that he did get a mention because he's always a bit sensitive about that. Um, my dad, he's, he's actually a real inspiration for me on a, on a number of levels, my dad. But the, the thing I really got from him was this a work ethic of working hard. And I think you got that from that area that we sort of grew up in, really, which was about like hard work beats talent. And actually, it's a lot of it is about hard work and you needed to work hard in, in those sort of areas. Uh, and this is the bit that I was worried I'd get a little bit emotional about because um, that's my mum and I'm a mummy's boy and pretty much everything that's good about me is, is, is from my mum. Um, and this is my family. I've got a, a wonderfully supportive wife, Emily, who's been through everything with me, um, loving and supporting the moral compass of, of a family and my two wonderful lads. So I'm really, really blessed to have a family. I think sort of understanding me is about understanding just how much that's shaped my career really because actually when Dylan was born I'd start just started working in prison so all of his life all of his trajectory is, is sort of happened as my sons have got older the family's got older so it's a really interesting uh, thing so that's some of the mushy stuff but there is one last slide of, of mushy stuff um, I really want to pay uh, homage respect to Dr Ruth Mann Dr Ruth Mann was a, a real mentor of mine she was a pioneer in the area of forensic psychology. She sadly died a, a few years ago. Um, her legacy and work lives on the way she treated people, the way she always had time for the next generation, the effort that she put in with people. And she gave me an opportunity when I had absolutely no right to have such an opportunity. She was just phenomenally sort of pioneering. The other person some of you might recognise in here is Professor Lynn Saunders OBE. Got your picture from, from the internet there, Lynn. <laughs> Lynn has, has a saying. Um, Lynn's been a massive influence in, in my career, a massive influence on me. She has a saying, the truth will do. Her integrity, she's the most honest, has the most integrity of any person I have ever met. I'm phenomenally blessed to call her both a colleague uh, and a, a friend. So I'm hoping your vote of thanks is reflective of that as well when you sort of say some words after this. And I also have to sort of pay respect to sort of Belinda White. I think pay respect, she's still alive. Um, uh, honest, she gave me my first start. She's always been really supportive in, in, in my career. We've done a lot of work um, together. Um, so I wanted to sort of pay respect to Belinda. So these sort of three sort of powerhouse women have really shaped and defined my career. And again, you sort of get thinking about the projects that you've been a part of. And as you start thinking about it, I started mapping out the different projects that I've been involved with. And, and, and actually over the last 15 years, I've been involved in so many really interesting, really diverse projects. I've been really blessed to work with wonderful people across a wonderful spectrum of, of, of projects, you know, from the prevention of, of sexual abuse, crime assistance, prison climate, understanding sexual interest, in, in children, the impact that that has on therapy, uh, even done some work on intimate partner violence, uh, on reintegration of, of people. So I've been able to do a lot of really, really applied work in, in the last sort of 15 years, and I'm, I'm phenomenally grateful um, for that. I don't have time obviously to talk about all of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to distill it down into sort of three main projects. The main, one of the main sort of projects that um, firstly defined and Camille mentioned it in the, in the introduction was understanding denial in, in people with sexual convictions. So this was the bedrock really of my PhD and was my sort of first real um, work that had sort of impact really on, on the field. And so this is just a selection of some of the work that I did, which was about reconstruing denial. At the time when I was doing this in therapy and in programs, if you denied your offence, you were refused treatment. Typically, people who denied served longer prison sentences, had outstanding treatment needs, 
and were pretty much just abandoned by the criminal justice system. So much so that this was a, this was a genuine assessment. You would go up to a person and say, it says down here, you're in denial. Is that right? They would say yes. Then you would say, well, we'll see you in six months time. And then you go back in six months time. It still says here that you're in denial. It's still in denial. Yes, I am. Well, OK, we'll see you in six months time. Honestly. That for me was just not a constructive way of going about working with individuals. I mean, first off, saying it seems like you're in denial it really doesn't seem like a fruitful way of starting a, a therapeutic relationship. So but this was at the time. So much of the work and research was about sort of understanding, actually just understanding why we deny, understanding how we use denial in an everyday sense. Um, and this is one of my sort of um, favourite, if the favourite is the right sort of word, um, book chapters, the importance of being earnest, rethinking the problem of categorical denial. What I really liked about that is this was a, a piece of work that Ruth and I spent years and years and years going back and forth on. It was a slow burn project. and Unfortunately, we didn't get it published before she passed away, which was quite sad. So th again, thinking about so how it, denial was particularly looked at by the sort of criminal justice system. And when you got into prison, it, people would say, well, they're not motivated for treatment. It's poor progress. It's pathological. It needs to be broken down first. And then intuitively it felt risky. So there was this thing about, oh, well, I don't know. It just feels risky. So this sort of intuition about it. And so they were refused treatment and this was as much as 35 to 40 percent of, of those who were eligible for treatment um, at the time. So much of my work was about thinking, OK, well, let's think about people who had been through the process, people who were denied. What kind of things were they saying? And they were saying things like, well, it gives you a lifetime tag. You know, if you're a sex offender, you're, you're a lifetime. It's a lifetime tag. It's like being branded. What's the worst thing you can say to someone? I'm Hitler. It'd have been easy if I'd murdered her less stigma, the whole character I've been portraying is shattered. So by that, it's like the whole identity, who you are, ceases to be the moment that you say, I'm a sex offender, right? The, your whole identity, who you are, completely goes. And if you th sort of think about it, even from a cost benefits analysis, what is the benefit of, of admitting at that point? You could lose family, you could lose friends, you could lose standing, you could lose everything. And the main reason I died is because I thought no one was, was, would speak to me ever again. So this sort of thing of like being isolated and lonely and ostracized. So when you sort of think about it, actually, they're pretty good reasons to deny anything, really. And if we're going to work with people in settings, adversarial settings like the criminal justice system, perhaps we're best off doing it by not directly going at saying, well, you should be admitting. Another sort of Dylan picture here. Um, I kept this in because this picture has been with me around the world. Uh, I've done training and presentations of denial, and this picture makes it through every single presentation that I do uh, on denial. And it's a nice way, obviously, of keeping your, your little boy close to you, even though he's a little older than that now. Um, anyone with experience of children will know that from a young age, they learn how to deceive lie, deny, right? So a toddler comes in and they've got chocolate around their face. And you say, you've been eating chocolate? And they'll say, no, daddy, no. Even though chocolate's around their face. And so why are they saying, why are they denying it? Is it because, you know, I'm such a terrible dad that I'm going to, you know, beat them? I'm, I'm going to do horrible things to them? No, really, the consequences are going to be quite minor. We might even sort of laugh about it. But you learn at a young age that actually, if I deny, if I pitch it in a slightly different way, then perhaps I get out of trouble or perhaps I don't have to explain myself. So we learn from a very young age to lie and deceive. From an evolutionary position, we've actually evolved to be the dominant species because of this. So, you know, if you think about how you when you meet someone, maybe you go on a first date, maybe you're meeting a group of people for the first time. It's like a form of social poker. No one's ever completely honest. They're always portraying a certain identity or a certain way of, of being. No one's sort of fully themselves. And that's a part of these sort of tactics that we use all the time. It's just ubiquitous of being human. So we, and also as well, the other sort of aspect of this is that biologically end to end, we are programmed, we have evolved to belong. So biologically, end to end, we've evolved to, to belong. And when we think about this in other terms, you look at it from a health sort of perspective. 
the effects of loneliness um, are comparable to major risk factors like early mortality for smoking or obesity. So being lonely literally kills us. So that again could make us think about sort of denial, actually make us think, OK, I can understand why someone might be denying the worst part. If I was to sort of say to you all now, I want you to think about the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you, the most thing that you're ashamed of. Let it sink in, let it mash around a little bit. And then I said, you know, hands up who wants to talk about it. There's going to be no one who's going to be really rushing to sort of put their hands up because we don't want to. So maybe one of the ways that we could work with this is thinking about actually, well, what's what other things can we work with? What do we what can we focus on? And if actually if you looked at the literature, you would find that actually intuitive beliefs so these are times that have been uh, talked about as correctional quackery. The things that we, we sort of think, oh, these must have an effect. It's a no brainer. Never work out in the way that you think they're going to work out. So it's anecdotal. Evidence really doesn't stack up. And what you actually find in the really high profile, big meta analyses is that denial doesn't predict recidivism. And that actually neither denial or, be, or excuse making is criminogenic. And actually trying to get people to accept more responsibility can actually work the other way. Like excuse making can make people at more of a risk. So things don't work the way you are. So, you know, tongue in cheek, we could say instead of spending all this resource and energy trying to get people out of denial, we should be trying to get them in denial because actually that's more protective. And that's the whole idea of this idea of making sense. So actually, when we looked at that and we looked at people's lives, if we took a lives approach rather than a criminogenic approach, what did we find? These are if you work in um, correctional settings, if you work in prison and probation, you'll be really familiar with what are the most empirically supported risk factors. What are the risk factors that when that stack up with evidence? So we have the central eight. The central eight are the Andrews and Bonter, four of which are antisociality, stuff to do with antisociality. Then we've got family and intimate relationships, employment, use of leisure time, and substance dispute. And then you look at what's empirically related to people with sexual convictions, offense supportive attitude, lifestyle impulsiveness, poor problem solving, lack of emotionally intimate adult relationships, negative social influences. Again, it's stuff to do with sort of self regulation social skills again it's to do with with relationships all of these can be addressed I wonder, but all of these can be addressed without someone having to disclose without them having to say yes i am this individual yes i've done this offense this is me you can examine people's relationships and this was the thing about people with denial we, we did this in the, in the work which was ask them people have all kinds of stuff relationship problems Hostile thinking, poor problem solving, lack of emotionally intimate relationships. It was all there. There was all this stuff there. So you could do really informed risk assessment and really informed clinical work without them having to admit. And this was really the success of this work. So the success of this work was that because of this, the um, the newer iteration of programs no longer made denial a um, a mechanism for you're not allowed on on treatment and also not only that but we moved away from disclosure focused so it wasn't about anymore about people admitting and talking about their offenses talking about their offenses instead it moved to lives it moved to actually what do people want out of their lives what does that look like for people how can we help people with the self-regulation problems how what does that look like for someone and so some of the recommendations was from this was about investing in relationships, building trust, and, and that really relationships matter. That phrase is going to get repeated on a, on a few occasions. Honestly. And that actually what we should do is really think about denial as, as a responsivity factor, that actually we just need to be, we need to respond better to it. And this idea of moving away from, this is focus on risk and instead focusing on, on lives and better outcomes and what do people want out of life and how can people be successful in life? So that was the first sort of main project. The second sort of main project that I want to talk about is um, about prison climate. Again, I don't know why I sort of decided to sort of put like loads of research. I'll look at all the research I've done on this. Um, <laughs> But, but hey, I put it in then. 
So uh, when I first started doing this, we, we there's so much work out there in terms of offender behavior programs. What risk factors are important? What's important for people as they transition from prison to community? What are the most important risk factors? I don't, so we learn time and time again in the literature, we find that in prison settings, we don't find an effect for treatment. That means that treatment doesn't have an effect in prison. It's one of the few truisms that we can sort of say in the criminological literature. There isn't a great deal of evidence for it. And one of the reasons for that is because the, you've got to sort of ask the question, are prisons the right sort of environment to be doing correctional therapy? This was the whole idea around this work, which is um, people's experience of imprisonment and the impact that that has on, on therapy. This looks really complicated. All you have to know is that in red, in all the different studies, is the um, is the effect size for recidivism. So does it have an impact? And basically, just to say if you're reading the graph, you rarely find an effect for prison in any of the literature that you, that you find. And yet we still put loads and loads of money in programs in prison. So much of the focus of this line of work was really thinking about, okay, we've got to get the wider prison climate right. We've got to get the setting right, the context right. That's the important thing if we're to have successful programs. And so I was part of research that really looked at the impact of, of prison climate. And we looked at it. If you look at it and look through the literature, what you find is that it's related to attitudes towards offending, dropping out of treatment programs, which is a really big no no because that's then elevates risk, mental health issues, adjustment during um, prison, whether or not people have an empathetic response is, is related to, to prison climate. Treatment motivation is 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 associated with that. Whether people feel safe is associated with prison climate. Whether people are ready for treatment and readiness for treatment is a barometer of whether people are going to be successful in treatment. This is all related to, to prison climate. When we looked at this, we did this in um, four different prisons. We looked at prisoners and staff's perspectives of um how they experience particular prisons loads of measures that sort of looked at this so this is looking at, at prisoners we looked at different measures such as prisoner relationships prisoner staff relationships attitudes readiness for treatment and change beliefs that they can change so a bit of a locus of control thing experience safety and the thing that was the biggest predictor of a really good climate was prisoner and staff relationships now, anyone that sort of works in the environment is probably thinking well, this just belongs to the, the, the journal of the things my mother could have told me. Prisoner and staff relationships are really important for the feel of a, of a prison. But programs have been really slow on the uptake in terms of utilising prison officers much more effectively in the wider context outside of programs. Honest. This. Honest. I don't, so we learn honest. I don't I had pneumonia a few months ago, and every so often, it's sort of like I'm still sort of getting over it. This is a, 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 a path analysis. It looks way more complicated um, than it actually is. All you need to know is that the thicker the line, the stronger the positive impact. Um, and the really important thing about this, so the, the, this is about what predicts readiness for treatment. Readiness for treatment is, like I say, a really good marker for whether people are successful in terms of their, of their treatment. And what this shows is hold and support, which is prisoner and staff relationships, is totally mediated by rehabilitative climate and then on to sort of readiness for treatment. So we've got to get the climate right to get the relationships right to get the readiness for treatment right. And hopefully this is this is a, a paper that even, I know she's, she's there, Eve and I uh, have, have put together and hopefully will be published soon. When you ask people about the environments, particularly these environments that was the, that were seen as much more positive, then we had guys saying things like, what made them positive? It was things like, um, it was a prison officer on my wing. And to have that, it was like, wow, it was amazing because she said, you know what? I respect you more and having that feedback, I can't put a price on it. 
Well, when I came to my wing and I sat and I sat down on one of, one of the tables, just me on my own, and the officer sat next to me and said, how are you doing? Everything all right? I was just blown away because you don't get that in these other prisons. Like, no, they treat you like shit. Being treated like a human, this was just part of like, you know, what it meant for good prison and staff relationships. What makes them positive? The honesty, the honesty that comes from doing the courses, from being open about what we're doing. So actually in prisons that had a good climate where they had good relationships, when you sort of talk to people about them, what were they? Well, these weren't sort of like relationships that was like, this isn't mind blowing stuff. This was thing being treated like being treated like a human. This is really important in whether people are feel adjusted. This is important for when people do programs. The therapeutic alliance is 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 really um, important in this as well, and a recognition as well when people go through programs that change is hard. Any meaningful change in your life is hard. Yeah, and we can all sort of think about that, and we can all think of times like how easy should it be to lose weight? Yeah, move a little bit more, eat a little bit less. How often do we struggle with that? You know, how often do we put barriers in the way? What about other sort of changing life? You know, even sort of just eating a little bit more healthily or just making small changes or small gains in your life. Change is bloody hard to do. So people are trying to make quantum shifts in how they think, perceive, how they're working with things, how they, you know, if there's a violent encounter on a wing, how they're taking a step back and reconstruing it and rethinking it in the moment. These are massive things. So change is hard. So treating people like humans is a fundamentally compassionate response, promotes feeling valued. If we can get that and the, the sort of treatment angle together and these work in tandem, then we can make much more meaningful relationships. And reciprocity is key in this as well. So reciprocity is one of my sort of favourite words within criminal justice because it's about shared problem solving, shared sort of experiences. There used to be this, this thing where if you were working with someone, you weren't allowed to tell them anything about yourself, like you, no background knowledge, no nothing, like you were a robot. Um, but then you're asking people to make these massive disclosures about the most personal things of their life. And actually, and this actually came up because I was looking at, at Luke in some of the work that we've just been doing on one of the cognitive skills programs, is that actually sharing with facilitators problems, sharing working through problems. So that reciprocal nature is really, really important. And again, it's a compassionate sort of response. And actually what we find is giving people trusted roles. So prisoner, prison to prisoner, to prisoner, that element of reciprocity where they're helping each other out. They've got a stake in the environment and a stake with each other is really, really important as well for personal change. Because it's, and this is part of the problem with the old programs, right? It's not enough to talk about change. You have to do change, right? Changes out there in people's behaviours, in what people are doing, right? It doesn't happen by accident. You can see it, yeah. If if you're going to the gym more, you can see you're going to the to the gym more. If people are managing relationships different, you can see that. And relationships matter like tenfold in the criminal justice system. Um, what I would say ab about this is that um, I'm a psychologist now in a, in a criminology department. Wherever you go in the criminal justice system, in any, actually in any walk of life, right? Relationships matter. In psychology, we're brilliant at coming up with three letter therapies. CBT, DBT, CFT, SLT. We've got the ABC model. Anything you think of a way of working with people, we can come up with three letters for it. No problem at all. But the one thing that really um, is the most successful when you look at like what what is actually about successful outcome of something the biggest accounts of the variance the thing that really matters is the therapeutic alliance it's the nature and quality of relationships the so same with denial same with sort of programs same with the sort of prison work it's all about relationships and that's actually very true of the work that i do like it's all about relationships with with other people the last little bit that I'm going to talk about is um, about preventing sexual abuse. I'm going to talk about some of the projects and a little bit about the, the, the Safer Living um, Foundation.
and then I'll I'll draw it um, to a close. So before this, I just as a little bit of context and overview. Generally speaking, when we work with individuals, we work with what's called tertiary prevention. This basically means that we work with individuals who are already known to the criminal justice system. So these are individuals, they've been through the criminal justice system, they've been sentenced, um, they've been sent to prison, and now they're, they're, and they've already created victims, yeah? So that's tertiary prevention. We're dealing with them once something's happened. Secondary prevention, or sometimes primary prevention, depends on your sort of definition, but secondary prevention is about trying to intervene with individuals before an offence has actually taken place. So is there a way, instead of creating victims, is there something we could have done with this individual before they offended? Is there something that we, can we intervene with individuals before they actually offend? And this is the crux really of what we're sort of talking about. So what can we do in the community to help people with a sexual interest in children who may be really bothered by that, worried that they're going to offend, and everyone before they offend is a person worried that they're going to offend until the day it happens and then they're an offender. But there's a process before that where people are struggling with it, where people are trying to seek help. So how do we get that into the, to the mainstream? One of the things that I think is actually quite interesting to think about is okay so if we're working with people um, with a sexual interest in children what are we pitching at here what are we what are we aiming at um, how many people does that equate to well the prevalence statistics that look at this suggest it's between one and five percent of of men have an entrenched interest in children have a sexual interest in children um, these statistics uh, are somewhat debatable michael cito for example you know will often say that this sort of one to five percent is is a bit tenuous but we think it's a it's around there when we look at it in terms of nationally representative studies we find that 4.1 percent of of uh, males report sexual fantasies having prepubescent children with 5.5 reporting paedophilic interest in a recent sort of meta-analysis that's much higher the variance actually is between two and 24 percent that's that's so no longer we talk about atypical sexual interest anymore, right? You can't call 24% sort of like this is a small number of people. This is a this is a large sample of individuals. And if you look at some degree of sexual interest in children, to so include things like propensity to offend, if I could get away with it, would you offend? Those sorts of things, then it's been as high as sort of 23% in samples. So this is a large number of people that may have sexual interest in children. It's really important to stress at this point that sexual interest in children is neither sufficient nor necessary condition for child sexual abuse. Not everyone who commits offences against children, in fact, the vast majority of people who commit offences against children do not necessarily have a sexual interest in children. But what we do know is that the presence of it can elevate people's risk. So we have to really understand it. We've got to think about what does that look like in the community? What does that look like for a particular service user? And how could we intervene? How, how can we intervene? We first of all have to understand it. And it's important because it's deviant, what's what used to be called deviant sexual interest or atypical sexual interest is one of the few empirically supported risk factors for sexual offence recidivism. So it's important for whether or not people are, are re, re, reconvicted. And in the dimensional model of sexual deviance from Carl Hansen, there's three dimensions to it. So there's the atypical sexual interest itself, which is the preference over deviant or non-deviant sexual behaviour. I would say atypical, but I'm just using the language of what was used in the model at the time. Sexual self-regulation, someone's ability to manage it. So as people might have thoughts. I mean, people can have thoughts about absolutely anything. There's um, there's nothing wrong with there's nothing wrong with thoughts. It's the the actions that are the that are the issue. So people's and some people aren't distressed by it. So people how they can manage it, the feelings that come with that, and people consistent with how they manage it. And then the intensity of sexuality. Some people by that experience that intensely. Others it may be overwhelming, like sexual preoccupation, for example. And these things are then related to to offending. So again, we have to understand the client group. So I've, I've nicked this slide from a colleague of of, of ours, Karenza Hocken, 
We've just published or about to publish a it's just coming out a new study on the treatment needs of um, people with a sexual interest in children to really understand. OK, again, we need to understand the client group to be able to pitch successful intervention. So what does it look like? What does our typical sort of service user look like? Well, I need help with uh, coping with life. Or, or of loneliness and we've already talked about social isolation being a sort of risk factor and also a risk factor for life as well. There's the stigma that people feel, you know, no one hating me more than myself. Even people who don't offend still have high degrees of stigma. Just experiencing it is enough to be highly stigmatized. This is, you know, and they haven't done anything wrong that you know, at this point, you know, they're experiencing maybe a sexual interest, but they haven't done it. They haven't acted on it, but they still feel high degrees of shame and stigma. Then there's this urge that people have to surf. Then there's this sort of mental health aspect, which is sort of, sort of comorbid, really, with a sexual interest in, in children. They need help dealing with, with, with these problems and help dealing with the social, emotional isolation and then the shame. And then the next part of this, so is we understanding that, and then we wanted to understand, well, what does it look like for people who have been convicted? So what about people who have offended against children, who have gone through therapy? What about understanding their trajectory so we can apply some of this into sort of our, into our lives, into our lives, into our, into our interventions, into thinking about this sort of client group? And this is a study that we did in terms of making sense of paedophile sexual interest in, in children. One of the things that, you know, when you asked a guy, you know, what is it you want from life? This is what they said. An appropriate, mutually rewarding, intimate relationship with a consenting adult that involves sex once a week. Honest. And my thought was, sign me up. Like, who doesn't want that? Like, that's that's what we all want. It's, like, it's not something like wow, that's really alien from some sort of other dimension or there's something there that isn't quite right. That was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I, can, I can get on board with that. I, can, I sort of understand where you're coming from with, with, with that. So what they wanted and what people want out of life, we're human beings, right? We're made of the same stuff. So it's unsurprising to me that actually when you ask people about it, that actually they're saying, it's pretty much the same thing that kind of everyone wants, really. So it was about, well, how do we work with people so that we can help manage the sexual interest and help people build the skills so that they can have lives that look like this and so that we don't create victims. And that's the important thing here, that we're trying to intervene and work with people before victims have been created. One of the ways we're trying to do this at the minute is through a European project that I'm a part of, Camille mentioned it in, in the introduction, as part of this program, I'm responsible for coming up with training and risk packages across Europe for people that work with individuals with a sexual interest in children. And what we don't have, and particularly frontline professionals don't have, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, social services uh, and, and related professionals don't really have universal tools across Europe. This is to help them with one interacting with the client group two, having the knowledge base so they can signpost people to service, and three, to be able to make appropriate evidence-based risk decisions. So this is part of what we've called, uh, with colleagues I've done this with in with the MOJ in Switzerland, we've come up with what's known as the risk and desistance, desistance hexagon. Hexagon because we focus on three risk domains and uh, six um, protective domains. And it also sounds pretty cool. The last thing I'm going to talk about um, for the next I don't know, about five minutes or so, um, is the Safer Living Foundation. The Safer Living Foundation is an organisation really close uh, to my heart. Um, we've been in business as an organisation now for 10 years as, as a charity. We formed as a charity in 2014. It's an organisation that um, myself um, and Lynn Saunders, who's the chair of, of, of the trustees and, and very much the sort of pioneer behind it, at the time, colleagues from NTU and, and prison and the probation service. Um, and Lynn's really good at sort of telling the origin story of it, but essentially it was being really dissatisfied with the lack of support that our, that men had as they transitioned from prison into the community, having no support whatsoever, just sort of dropping off the face of the cliff. And actually, what can we do to help 
facilitate that support? What support can we put in place? Because again, that's the risk factors. The risk factors for people are in that sort of those vulnerable times, those transitional times, as people are going from one thing to the next. These are really important um, markers. And if we intervene there, we can stop. Victor, we're doing this to sort of protect the public and, and keep communities safe, as well as helping our men reintegrate back into the community. Over the last 10 years, we've had a number of, of projects. We've had circles of support and accountability, which is where you have um, a core member, which is a guy that's um, been a high risk guy, generally speaking, has been released from prison um, uh, and is then with a trained set of volunteers. And we help them readjust and reintegrate back into the community. We've started that in prison before we started that at HMP Watton at the time. It was the only um, um, it was only in Europe, I want to say the world, but was Europe a better sort of thing? World, yeah, I thought so. So we were the only ones in the world running it at the time, prison-based circles of support. And then we did community-based, we've had young people's projects. I'm going to talk a little bit about our prevention project uh, and the Safer Living Centre, it used to be called the, the, the Corbett Centre. I want to talk a little bit about the Safer Living Centre, partly because there could be students here and perhaps you're involved, want to get involved with uh, work in the criminal justice system, or perhaps you want to work with um, individuals because you want your career path to go that way. The Safer Living Foundation, we we are always looking for volunteers, always looking for people to sort of um, give their time to help Ben sort of reintegrate. In our Nottingham City Centre, we're also looking at, at doing stuff in Derby as well. We offer practical skills, um, practical support, cookery classes, IT, computer classes, financial advice, religious services. And there's a big part of this, which is active citizenship approach, which is, OK, guys, what do you want? What do you want this, this, this centre to look like? What kind of things do you want? And that's given a whole new stream of things from debate clubs, mindfulness, more sort of cookery stuff. We've had students before you know, come in and do sort of like, you know, cooking on a budget, that sort of thing. So it's become a very, um, so it's really grown. Like Camilla said, we had, we've had over 300 referrals. We've had over 50 active uh, service users that use it. Um, there's my dad, by the way. And he, he got a mention earlier on. You literally come in for the last two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> But it's good to it's good to have you here, Dad. You, you were missed. Everyone was talking. Where is he? Anyway, um, <laughs> helping prepare work, helping people as they sort of helping people whatever they sort of really need, really to sort of reintegrate, to keep them safe in the community, um, sure. and to help them sort of reintegrate. Um, and so they don't reoffend. And this is part of the sort of stuff that we do. We've got pets as therapy. And cooking, cooking sounds a really, it sounds, in some respects, you could sort of think of it, oh, cooking, that sounds lame. But what we've found is that this is one of the most profound things that our men do, right? So often most of them can't cook or have literally no independent living skills and have been living on sort of digestive biscuits. And cooking, if you sort of think about in your own homes and perhaps you have this sort of thing, if you're cooking, you're normally in the kitchen, in the family. Kitchens are usually a hub for sort of stuff. And that's what it is in the Safer Living Foundation Centre. It's like a hub. It's a hub for people talking. They talk about risk related stuff. That's not sort of sat opposite them saying, you know, how's things going? And have you had thought about this? Have you been here or been there? It's done in a much more sort of informal setting and people talk about all aspects of their lives just while doing this. So cooking is just one aspect of it, but the process gives us so much more and gives them so much more as well. It gives them hope. And anyone that's seen Shawshank Redemption when Red Lee reads that sort of letter, you know, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things and no good thing ever, ever dies. It's so important. And, and it again, sounds a little bit, oh, hope sounds really airy fairy, but hope is a protective factor. Having hope, being believed in, is related to people not offending, is related to successful outcomes. So hope is, as well as, you know, it's, it sounds a bit fluffy, is actually really, really important. And there's a whole load of literature that backs that up. And I'm going to focus very, very last little bit on our prevention project. So this is 
an intervention that is for people who are struggling with a sexual interest in children who are worried that might they may offend and it's pitched at people who um, are not part of the criminal justice system some of our well, good proportion of our service users have had access you know have had issues with the criminal justice system or have been in prison or have convictions but you don't have to have a conviction it's for people who are struggling with those thoughts um, and this is um, an approach that is bedrock is compassion focused therapy and acceptance and commitment and comes from uh, our clinical lead uh, Dr Karenza Hocken and around this work is about refu reducing it's about it's basically an approach which is about de-shaming working on people to reduce fusion with unhelpful thoughts so this is this idea that you're not your thoughts you know a lot of the times we compare ourselves with really unhelpful thoughts you know I'm not a very good lecturer and you sort of say it enough and you fuse to it and you suddenly start you start believing it it may be true um but it's probably not a helpful thought right I need to diffuse I need to work I need to disentangle that you may think about this kind of a person but actually these are unhelpful thoughts and spirals that we get into so part of act is about what's called thought diffusion you are not your thoughts and you can do this by just creating distance in your mind by creating a little bit of a gap and it's just enough as a little bit of a gap to then think well, actually I'm not my thoughts I'm not, I could think anything I could think I could run out of here I could think I'm going to do whatever it doesn't make it real yeah it's not who I am it's not my identity and then with this is about developing other skills for emotion regulation skills for sexual self-regulation you could build a really good program just on self-regulation impulse control we talked about the central eight four of which are about antisociality we just need to make people better skilled at dealing with emotions dealing with their sort of sexual urges urge surfing and then developing skills for values-based living one of the sort of key things I suppose as an organization that we do which is about living to our values I mentioned about Lynn a bit being a really a person of really high integrity and high honesty this is these are values that cut through um our Ooh, service yeah. like you know Blackpool through a stick of rock they're really really integral and actually if you help people build lives for values based living what do you want out of life what are your values how do you live to your values this is how you get people to to live towards that and this is from uh, work that uh, my PhD student who's in the second round there um, looking at the some of the early evaluation work of our project and the big thing that co comes out of this is that actually the red is before they go on to the intervention and the blue is post and what you see is the big thing that when the thing that we're really pleased about is shame comes down an awful lot hope increases and so does uh, self-esteem and, and, and well-being and particularly shame and, and hope in sort of significant degrees so these are really important early markers for us of course we face challenges um, this was actually about our charity sexual abuse victim slam lottery funder charity that asks paedophiles to drink asks volunteers to drink with paedophiles to stop them getting lonely and this is part of the challenge we face in terms of media backlash um, and the way things are sensationalized our client group don't live in hermetically sealed vacuums they know exactly what the community thinks of them even if they haven't committed an offense this is a big challenge for us I think all of us at some point have received death threats or had to deal with with those abuse that's come from some of the challenges and finally and very very quickly I'll just sum up with some sort of reflections so thank you very much for the people that you that come out and you've sort of indulged me as I've sort of gone through sort of aspects of my career um the sort of key reflections that I have really is that collaboration is key there's absolutely no way I'd have done any of completed most of these projects any of these projects without collaboration collaboration with colleagues who've become friends who've become friends like throughout life or with partner agencies, prisons, NHS, third sector, collaboration is key. You have to put the work in in those in those networks. It is so particularly crucial, particularly in my world. If you want to do applied work and you want to do good work, collaboration is key. Reciprocity is key. I've said that a few times. Shared problem solving, working together, 
is the only way that you can get this work done. Compassion is key. Sometimes compassion is hard. Sometimes it makes you reflect and turn towards things that make you feel really uncomfortable, make you ask difficult questions. When I first started working with people with sexual convictions, my son had, had just been born and I was having intrusive thoughts about, you know, while I was changing his nappy and, and, and things and things like that. So he, it will push you in certain directions, but compassion is the way that you, you get through it. Connection is key. Connection because we need connection. Like I say, we're biologically programmed end to end to belong. Hard times when you face them don't last and that living by your values is pretty much a super way of of living a good life, I would say. And that people remember how you make them feel and that really, really matters. So there's this saying that I sort of live by really, which is that old saying of people don't remember for what you do or say, but for how you make them feel. And I look back to the sort of first slide and I look back to family and I look back to the really important people that have shaped my life in my career. And it's people that have made me feel valued and trusted and given me those positions. And that's really mattered to me. How you make other people really feel really, really matters. I think that's probably a good place to end it. Thank you very much.